How's everyone doing? Rails Comp Day One. <laughs> Welcome to Room 101E. My name is Alex Reef, and I am 101 elated to be here. Uh, this is just my second time coming to Rails Comp, uh, and my first time speaking at any conference. So super exciting. Go easy on me. Um, I am from a little company called Weed Maps. Uh, you may have heard of us. Uh, we are the largest technology company solely focused on the cannabis industry. Uh, we have solutions for retailers, growers, wholesalers, consumers, pretty much every uh, market vertical in the cannabis industry, we have some kind of software as a solution uh, service for. And today I'm gonna be talking about a big day at Weed Maps uh, and how we kept throughput high on Green Saturday. So my team is focused on what we call our discovery API. Uh, it's a read-only API that serves most of the content on our front end. Uh, so the website and our native apps are hitting the discovery API to get their content. Uh, its data source is Elasticsearch, which gives us super quick reads uh, and a simple horizontal scaling mechanism uh, when pressure gets too high on the cluster. Uh, we source Elasticsearch from our Q pipeline that we've implemented called Dabit, uh, which is a layer on top of RabbitMQ. So messages are put on the queue uh, by our core application. This is mostly uh, our business owners uh, working with the admin panel and the CMS. Uh, this core application hosts uh, most of the business logic uh, and it maintains the source data in Postgres. Uh, if you wanna hear more about Postgres and how we do it, uh, come to Matt Dzinski and Craig Buchek's talk tomorrow. Uh, they got uh, stuff about Postgres, Active Record, all that good stuff. So data makes its way from core on to RabbitMQ to the Discovery API into Elasticsearch, and then people surrounded in cloud of smoke uh, get that data. <laughs> if that setup sounds interesting to you at all and you want to come talk about it more, uh, come see us at our booth at the exhibit hall. We're definitely hiring. Now the Discovery API has three main areas of focus. Uh, firstly, it determines where I am. Then it determines the retailers and delivery services, cannabis doctors near me. And then it shows me their products and the best deals I can find on them. So in short, when people are searching for green, they are using the services that my team are responsible for. And there's one particular day when all kinds of people are searching for green. Now, if you read the conference program, you probably read Green Saturday and were like, huh, is that a real thing? Did you make that up? Well, kind of. So uh, this is the second to last weekend in April. Uh, a lot's going on. Uh, on Friday, we observed the first night of Passover, uh, witnessed the miracle of the burning bush and remembered that. Uh, on Easter Sunday, we remember uh, Jesus Christ ascending to a higher plane. Um, and on Monday, uh, we celebrate our planet the oceans, the green trees, the beautiful land all around us. But on that Saturday, two days before Earth Day, there was another holiday, what I'm calling Green Saturday. Now, I have an asterisk there because uh, it's not always on Saturday, but it definitely is always on this date, April 20th. You may know it more colloquially, colloquially as 420. Uh, this is the day that we celebrate the cannabis movement, all the progress we made in access and uh, criminal justice reform, and to celebrate, people consume a lot of cannabis. So to get that load, uh, they need to find it, and to find it, they come to Weed Maps. So Weed Maps on April 20th experiences our highest traffic spike of the year, and it is consistently elevated year over year. Now, I've been at Weed Maps uh, since 2016. Uh, you can tell by my limited edition early run white get high shirt. Can't get those anymore. Um, so 2016 was my first year at Weed Maps. Uh, came around 420. I was expecting a party. Unfortunately, that party was over GoToMeeting because our database on the core application was deadlocked within a few hours of the start of business. Needless to say, that was a dark day in Weed Maps history. 
But from there, we really got serious about hardening our systems. We brought DevOps in-house. We started the hiring spree, which we are still ongoing today. And every year since then, we've been making improvements. So in 2017, uh, we split our Postgres reads and writes from our core application. Our end user traffic is very, very read heavy. Uh, so that took the pressure off our master node. Um, so no more deadlocks, good stuff. Um, and, but by 2017, we also had this new V2 API uh, backed by Elasticsearch. It was used by a few routes, didn't, uh, used by a few clients for a few routes, didn't do a whole lot, but it did take a little more pressure off the core application. So despite a little shakiness, uh, we stayed up in 2017, good year. Uh, and by 2018, California had gone recreational. We needed a lot more scale. To do that, uh, we containerized our applications, put them in Docker. Uh, we use a system called Rancher uh, to orchestrate our Docker containers. Allows us to scale up really quickly, change configuration if we need to. Um, and we also, uh, by 2018, uh, most of the traffic uh, was going to this V2 API. It had grown up, it's now the Discovery API. Um, but it was still on the original a uh, small Elasticsearch 2 cluster we had set up way back in the day. Uh, it was having some stability issues, so we went ahead, upgraded to the latest version at the time, Elasticsearch 6, and more importantly, we really got our index configuration tuned to the data that we have. 2018, uh, 420 was a Friday. It was one of the more boring Fridays that had at Weed Maps. Good stuff. Cut to 2019. Uh, been at Weed Maps three years. My white shirts, threadbare, kind of faded, and uh, our traffic baseline is about double what it was a year ago. We had a few high traffic events, things were a little bit shaky, but what do we do? There's, what's the low hanging infrastructure change we can make? What can, we, what can we shoehorn DevOps into fixing for us? Obviously Kubernetes. No, it's not that talk we got serious about handling our requests. So here is a view of the Weedmaps homepage. You can see there's two main routes that power most of the content, slash location and slash brands categories. The location gets the bulk of the traffic. Has three main phases. One, it determines the user's location based on geolocation provided coordinates, a device geolocation. Uh, it maps that location to one or more sales regions based on what services are legal and available in your area, and then it pulls the businesses advertising in those sales regions. Now, it's debatable whether a single API should be serving all that information, um, but that's an ongoing push and pull with our front end clients. I'm sure the back end engineers here can relate to some extent. But in general, this is data that doesn't change with extremely high frequency. So we think, maybe we can cache this. But we still want a good experience for a business owner who updates their page, Maybe they have a new logo, maybe they're trading under a new name, or they buy some new advertising position. They want to see their stuff quick. So is there a compromise? Yes. That compromise is microcaching. Now microcaching is a strategy where you cache the entire web response for a brief period. So in this case, micro refers to your time to live, not necessarily your cache payload. If you're like us and have these huge requests, uh, your cache payload will actually be kind of big. Um, you heard of microdosing, kind of the opposite of that. You took a small little dose and it lasts for a long time. This, we take a big thing and hold it on to a small little bit of time. Now, we love Nginx at Weedmaps and we have it enabled at many layers of our application, uh, our application stack. Uh, and Nginx makes this caching really easy. Uh, as you can see at line two, uh, we have this proxy cache path directive. Uh, by default, it's stored in the file system so you see the path there, uh, you define a key zone. In this case, I'm calling it my cache, and I'm saying I can hold 150 million uh, cache keys. And there's some other stuff you can configure. In this case, I'm saying I only want to hold on to 200 megabits, megabytes before uh, I start purging. So scroll down a bit to line eight. Uh, you see our location block. This is where we proxy to Puma or Unicorn or whatever our app server is. And a little bit below that is where we configure our proxy settings. So we say, I want to use that my cache I just defined. I'm saying I want to hold on to only the 200 response codes. 
and I'm holding on to them for half a minute, 30 seconds. And the proxy cache key is where I determine all the things that are unique about my request. Um, in, our, uh, in our case, this is pretty complex. We have some routes that are based on GeoIP uh, and different uh, device uh, things they send us, but this is just a simplified example. Uh, we're just using the Nginx variables, the host name, the request URI, and the authorization header, uh, so if people are logged in, their unique content doesn't get cached. But we're in Docker, and we're using a local file system, so we have many instances of this local cache and they can't be shared. So our cache hit rate's not gonna be great. Here comes OpenResty to the rescue. OpenResty is just Nginx served with some gourmet accoutrement. Uh, it's, uh, it comes with a Lua runtime and some libraries to make that small language a little easier to work with. And it comes with a series of Nginx modules that allow Nginx to talk to non-HTTP upstreams, like Memcache. So just like we configure our rails.cache instance uh, for memcache to store our, uh, our cache values across apps and app instances, we can do the same thing here with Nginx using OpenResty. So we roll out OpenResty, add the microcaching, how we do? Nah, not so great. Uh, what, got about five, six percent cache hit ratio. So we don't have that many kinds of requests but we find that we get a lot of variation in them. Why is that? Well, we rely on our mobile devices to send a user's coordinates to geocode their location. And mobile devices send very precise coordinates. We're seeing up to like 12 decimal points in our logs. Really crazy. Uh, and most applications don't need this level of precision. So here's a chart that I stole from Wikipedia that I turned into a graph. Uh, it's charting uh, the, the distance that corresponds to each degree of decimal precision. So distance on the x-axis, uh, degrees on the y. So as you can see, uh, below the fifth uh, decimal point, we're at sub-meter precision, probably not that important. Or a little more concretely, uh, here is the location of our Weed Maps after party. Uh, it's at the Aria at Jin Lun on First Street, just a few blocks from the convention center. Hope to see you all there tomorrow. Uh, RSVP at railsconf.com slash parties or come see us at the booth. Now Google tells me that uh, this coordinate is, let's see, 44.984549 degrees north by 93.268504 degrees west. That's a lot of numbers. Maybe we don't need all of those. Let's drop it down to four. And we're in the same block, in the same building. So maybe we can go down to four. Let's try two. How does that do? A few blocks away. Maybe that'll work for us. Maybe it won't, depending on our use case. Maybe one. Try that. Well, you can't see one because it's up the interstate, the north part of the city probably a little bit too far away. So the sweet spot, probably somewhere between five, four, three, maybe two, depending on your use case. But where do I do this rounding? Well, we have a dry struct um, in our application that models coordinates. Shout out to the dry RB team, we love you. We use a lot of your stuff in the discovery API. So we can easily stick a round method in here. See at line five, we just pass in uh, precision we get a new instance uh, with the latitude and longitude rounded to what we say. Pretty straightforward. We can use that when we pass it into our queries. So pull it out of params on line one, do that rounding on line two, and then stick it into the query at line three. But if we're doing it in Rails, we're already behind the microcache, so that won't really help our cache rate. But remember, we have our microcache set up in Nginx, so we think, Maybe we can do some kind of rewrite, uh, change that request URI uh, before the cache is accessed. And indeed, that's what we did. The sort of Nginx we re rewrite we chose to do uh, was done using a Lua plugin at the API gateway that sits in front of all our API services. So that discovery API, that core application I was talking about, 
Uh, we have some Elixir services uh, that power B2B applications. Uh, if you're curious about those, come find us. Uh, so all those different services are uh, proxied by this main gateway. And that gateway is powered by a service called Kong. So Kong is just open Rusty, so it's just Nginx, uh, but its special twist is it has dynamically implemented routes, and for us, it has an awesome plugin architecture that works just like Rails middleware. So there's hooks to modify the request and response at different stages of the handling. But I'll say, Lua is not so fun. Uh, so someone maybe wants to write some crystal bindings for Nginx, that'd be dope. So, back to our before graph. Cache hit rates, about five, six percent. We roll out the plugin and enable it on our discovery API routes, and how do we do? Much better, about nine, 10 percent. I'll take it. So cool, Nginx is handling a few thousand requests now. Rails can take a break. Thanks, Nginx. But it can't really take a break, because we still got thousands more location requests to process. So it was time to look into our route controller. Uh, we use New Relic at Weedmaps uh, as our application performance monitor, and it has really detailed transaction traces. Uh, it was telling us that our region query was consistently the slowest running operation. We turned on Elasticsearch's slow query logs. They confirmed the same. So out of these three main parts uh, to the route, uh, the geolocation, uh, determining the user's region, and then pulling up the business's advertising, we chose to focus on the regions. Fortunately for us, though, our sales team is not too often changing these region boundaries once they've been established. So given a coordinate, it's not very likely that the region's gonna change uh, minute to minute or even really day to day. So let's cache that, um, but a little longer this time. We don't need that microcache. Uh, in this case, we're doing 10 minutes. So here's that rounding snippet again, uh, pulling our coordinates out, passing it to the struct, doing the rounding. And now we're just using uh, a standard Rails cache fetch. So passing our cache key, uh, define our time to live, say in 10 minutes, really probably could have been 10 hours, doesn't really matter. And if the cache key hasn't been set or the old value uh, is expired, then we get that block called uh, line six. We're doing that query again. So cool. This is what's termed a read-through cache. Uh, pretty simple, pretty standard. It's what most people think of uh, when they think of caching, but there is an alternative. Uh, ask yourself, will the data I get on my cache refresh likely be different from what I have stored? Will my users even notice if it is? If you can say no to either of these questions, you might want to replace the simple cache with what's called a right behind cache. So what's the difference? With the right behind, if the cache key is expired, rather than going to refresh it uh, as part of the fetch and returning the new data, the expired cache value gets returned. But at the same time, we'll enqueue a background worker and that background worker's job is to go fetch the new data and store it in the cache. So the next person that comes and gets it will have the new data. That's something we had to implement ourselves. So uh, check out this set method on line seven. Normally when you'll call your cache, uh, you'll pass the, the time to live uh, to the set uh, as part of the, the parameters to the call. But in this case, uh, we're storing our time to live as it expires at uh, as part of our cache payload. So you can see that on uh, line eight and nine, we're setting up our cache payload. When I go to fetch it uh, in this get method, uh, we first check the expiration date, uh, see that at line 16. Um, if we're past the expiration, or if we're before the expiration date, everything's still good. We go ahead and return our payload at line 17. But if we're past the use by date, we first have to call the refresh before returning it. And that refresh just fires off uh, a background worker that calls our API or whatever the resource is and then sticks it back in that cache. Um, so you can see at line 27, we just have a simple active job 
and uh, that's responsible for calling the set as part of the cache. So the ultimate goal here is to shift any, sp is to shift any spike in upstream latency from uh, the end user as part of their synchronous web request to the background. It's much better to have a slow sidekick worker than a slow API route. So in this use case, our upstream service is Elasticsearch, where we have all our regions stored. So what are some ways that latency can increase with Elasticsearch? One, uh, we've noticed burst of writes under heavy read loads uh, burst latency. So let's say we're on 420, it's about noon, uh, shops have been open since 8 a.m., running out of stock, so they hit that sync button on their POS to take all the out-of-stock items out. Uh, we have a huge menu item, let's say 4,000 items, all being written at once. A uh, couple of those, we'll see a little bit of spike of latency. But there's a second thing. Continually running expensive read queries. So Elasticsearch has a feature where you can join documents into a kind of parent-child relationship. Uh, we use this feature to store our region document metadata separate from the geometry. <laughs> Suffice it to say, uh, when we implemented this, it was a little more convenient uh, to do these delta updates, not having to pull the geometry around every time. Um, and querying was still pretty convenient too. Uh, you could express a query that was like, find a region that has a child document, that has a geometry, that matches, uh, matches my coordinate. It's not the nicest code to write. Uh, if anyone's worked with the Elasticsearch DSL, you got these like super deep nested structures, uh, so the Ruby wasn't great, but it worked. Or did it? As the kids say, yikes. If you care about perform query performance, you should not use this query, coming straight out of the Elasticsearch query documentation. And we use this on our main route. Oof. As is so often the case in life, what seemed cheap and convenient at the time ends up being expensive and harmful down the way. <coughs> should he be a chore? Sorry. <coughs> Occupational hazard. So, what do we do? We rethought our indexing strategy. We collapsed the two documents into a single structure. We built some tooling, uh, taking advantage of the Elasticsearch painless, painless scripting interface, and we maintained those data, uh, those delta updates. How'd that do for performance? So our peak before the release was about 45 milliseconds of Elasticsearch time in that location's route. Uh, our new peak was about 30 after the deployment. So 33% improvement. What, just what we were hoping for. Awesome. So is there any other place where we're using this? We could maybe make a similar optimization? Naturally, the answer is yes. So remember that other route from the home page with the brands categories? Uh, you see the flower, the concentrate. Um, previously, this home page would show the brand logos instead of the product cards. And that legacy feature made use of the join documents. Fortunately, uh, the new feature did not. So we learned our lesson at least that time. But our clients were requesting both the new and the old data. So even though we fixed it, Going forward, we still had that nagging old query. Well, we worked with our product team. We came up with the strategy to map the, old, the new to the old so we could use the same query to generate both the new and the old response. And we eliminated that join. With such a great result with the regions, replacing this would probably have a great result too, right? Whoopsie. What happened there? Now, you might be thinking that big brown spike is Elasticsearch, and we did something wrong there. But Elasticsearch is actually the purple. We got a little bit better. No, the brown is the time spent converting Elasticsearch's query response to our own API response format. 
So we're mapping. If anyone's worked with that, you have to like dig hits, hits, zero, source, pull out your fields. It's not so great. And then we have to map that to our own data categories, JSON API. It's a mess. So essentially, it's Ruby using memory and taking CPU time to build hashes. And it turns out, just like sifting Keef to make hash, moving data in and out of Ruby hashes is pretty time consuming too. And it's expensive in C. Now, it's beyond the scope of this talk, but take my word for it, there are a lot of data structures involved with this uh, hash operation. So this is the code behind just a simple C lookup, a uh, simple hash lookup in C. Now, I'm no C developer, but I see some nested conditionals, I see a go-to statement, there's some loops, and I know pretty universally nested conditionals often cause some pain. So what caused the big spike in Ruby wasting time with dumb hash? No one likes hash. No one smokes hash anymore. As it turns out, <laughs> that when we started using the new non-join query uh, result to build that legacy response, we ended up parsing that Elasticsearch response time two times over. So twice the CPU time. All right, darn. How do we fix that? Simple memoization. But what really was the problem here? The problem was that we forgot to test the performance of our changes. We made some assumptions about how a change manipulating our data would perform, but we never confirmed those assumptions. Once we did on the fix, we were able to confirm the latency drop back down to what we'd expect. So two routes, two sets of improvements, ready for Green Saturday, 420. We're pumped. But the only performance test that really counts is how production performs on that big day. Anyone curious how we did? <laughs> All right. At our peak, we were serving 100,000 requests a minute through our Kong API gateway. 53,000, 53% 53 of those were going through that discovery API. 20% of those were those location requests, so all that little fine micro-tuning really, really paid off. Our cache hit rate was a respectable 9%, so about 5,000 requests coming out of the cache. Thanks, Nginx, doing a good job. And this traffic is not quite three times the normal throughput we see on Saturdays. Um, and with this, our average latency stayed under 100 milliseconds, in fact, the average was about 80 at our peak time. So, doing great, sweetie. <laughs> and indeed, we had 100% uptime. <laughs> so, quite the success. As you might imagine, that party vibe I was expecting way back in 2016 was in the air on this green Saturday, this 420. So, to reflect back, what did we do to achieve this success? Well, for one, we cached a lot of stuff at different layers of the service. So you should consider whether your users always require the most up-to-date information coming straight from your source of truth or whatever data store you use. If you run a public website, there are probably more than a few cases where you can cache your web responses, at least for a brief period. Tune your user input to make it work for your application. The various sensors and signals that we carry with us all day long in our smartphone uh, can share a wide set of very, very precise data with our applications and our services. So depending on your use case, you might want to manipulate that data before plugging it into your business logic or your cache key generator. The GPS sensor does not know that a particular route needs only to know the user location with the zip code level granularity. We limited the external requests uh, we made that might affect our user's response time. One of the worst feelings is looking at your application performance monitor and seeing a big spike in your response time 
and then you trace that back, go to that external services tab, and you see there's a big corresponding st spike in that external service response time. So where you can, try to move that external request to a background worker and persist it for your API service to fetch later. Um, if it doesn't make sense to do this kind of uh, right behind caching, you can have a cron job that refreshes it on some kind of regular interval. Uh, so think about what kind of data really matters to your users um, and how up to date that needs to be. Please, please reconfirm your schema is right for your queries. This applies to any database where you're defining your indexes, Elasticsearch, Postgres, MySQL, whoever you're using. Um, often as your app evolves, uh, your initial index setup may no longer be ideal. Uh, maybe there's some new screen you added uh, that's querying or filtering on a field that wasn't originally intended for filtering. Or maybe you're doing some kind of join in an unexpected way. These things come up. Uh, in our case, our index setup was just proved to be against best practice. Um, so I recommend going back and reviewing the documentation for the latest versions of your database. Amongst the new feature details, I found existing functionality um, gets clarified. Gotchas that are discovered out in the wild uh, are called out. You might feel called out for some things you're doing. Don't get discouraged. And finally, do those benchmarking. When you're in the midst of making these improvements to your application, it's easy to move a little too fast. Once you have a fix, it's human nature to want to rush to get into production and get the best result for your users. But spend the time to set up that performance test. There are many tools out there you can use uh, to simulate load. Uh, there's Apache Benchmark and JMeter uh, that we use at Weedmaps, uh, WRK or Wrench or some other ones that are out there. Um, so check out your master branch. Uh, run your test there to get a baseline. Then compare the results when you check out your feature branch. Uh, when you validate your assumptions, you might just catch something unexpected before it's messing with your app decks. In general, what we found, the key to high throughput uh, was giving our Rails app and its database a break. Take advantages of the other services you already have set up. Likely, whatever proxy layer you have or your Elasticash stores are probably underutilized. Let them take some of the edge off. And at Weedmaps, we know a little something about taking the edge off. Thank you.